Hi everyone, it's Mrs. T. I just want to give you a review of organic chemistry. Uh, so you should probably have your reference tables out, a uh, piece of paper or something to write with so that you can take some notes if you want to. Uh, Mrs. T, again, this is Mrs. T's Chem Talk for organic review. In case you don't know me, I'm Elizabeth Tuminello. I'm a chemistry teacher at Calhoun High School in Merrick, New York. So we're going to get started with just some basic information about these organic compounds. And organic compounds, we say that they are generally symmetrical. Not every organic compound is a symmetrical molecule. And remember, with M-SNAP, for molecules, symmetrical is a nonpolar molecule. And since they're generally non uh, generally nonpolar, they're generally insoluble in water because water is a polar molecule. And remember that we said in the solutions chapter that like dissolves like. So since water is polar, organic compounds don't generally dissolve in water. Uh, they are symmetrical nonpolar, so they don't generally dissolve in water. These organic compounds are generally non-electrolytes because they don't have any mobile ions in solution. They have weak intermolecular forces, which means they have low melting and boiling points, and they tend to have very slow reactions due to high activation energies. Now in class, we spoke about the fact that these high activation energies um, can be seen in the organic reactions that keep us alive in our bodies, and that's why we need the enzymes to lower the activation energy for the reactions so that the reactions in our body can take place in such a speed to keep us alive. So when we talk about these organic compounds, usually the first thing we talk about, we talk about hydrocarbons, and hydrocarbons are going to be compounds that have only hydrogen and carbon. Um, and we have this table P of organic prefixes. I like to call it table prefix. If you can see that. So P for prefix. We remember that anytime a group or a compound has one, carb uh, one carbon, we're going to say meth, two carbons F, three carbons prop, four carbons bute, etc. We also have this table Q for the series, the homologous series of hydrocarbons, and we said that a homologous series is any group that, uh, any group of carbons, any group of carbon compounds that um, every time we add a carbon, we add two hydrogens. And remember that alkanes have single bonds and are saturated. And alkanes have the general formula CNH2N plus 2, which means that if we know the number of carbons, we double it and add 2 to get the number of hydrogens. Every member of the alkane series is going to start with its prefix for its number of carbon atoms and end in ANE. And remember that every carbon needs a total of four bonds, so you're just pretty much going to see carbons with lines surrounding them above, below, left and right. For alkenes and alkynes, remember that these are unsaturated and they are unsaturated because they don't have all single bonds. They don't have the maximum number of hydrogen atoms that you can have on a carbon. For alkenes, we have a double bond in the chain and I like to say that the, the general formula is double-double because if something has a double bond, we double the number of carbons to get the number of hydrogens. And alkynes for the general formula, the molecules or the names will always end in YNE. And we're going to take the number of carbons, double it, and subtract two to get the number of hydrogens. Alkynes all have a triple bond somewhere in the molecule. When we talk again about these saturated hydrocarbons, for these saturated hydrocarbons, alkanes again have the general formula CNH2N plus 2. They have all single bonds. If we want to draw methane, remember that meth means one carbon. Ane means follow this general formula. And remember, for we need four bonds, so we're going to draw carbon with its four bonds, each directed in a tetrahedron which remember is a symmetrical shape, and each of those single bonds connects to a hydrogen. Just remember again that these bonds each represent a pair of electrons. Every line represents a bond. Every bond represents two electrons. For ethane, it's going to be two Cs, and again, ane tells us CNH2N plus 2. So for ethane, I'm going to draw my two Cs with a single bond between them. In each carbon, remember, gets a total of four bonds, so 
there will be three hydrogens on each carbon. Remember that for ethane, we can either draw it the way that I just drew it, or we can put in the H's for the purposes of the Regents exam. If you leave the lines uh, without the H's, that would be considered an implied hydrogen. So either one of these two structures would be acceptable for ethane. Prop, remember, we fix for three carbons. Ain tells us follow that it's all single bonds and follow this formula. So propane is going to have three carbons with the end carbon having three hydrogens and the middle carbon having two. So methane for C1 becomes CH4 when we use the general formula. Ethane when we use the general formula becomes C2H6 and propane becomes C3 H8, and if we count up the hydrogens on each of these and the carbons on each of these, those match um, what we drew. When we talk about isomers, once we get usually to four carbons, we have a possible way, uh, two possible ways or more than two possible ways of drawing um, the structures. So isomers are going to have the same molecular formula. but different structures or different structural formulas. And once we get to four carbons, that's usually when we start to be able to have isomers. Butane is C4H10 because again, but is four carbons. Ane means 2N plus 2. Ane means single bonds. So one of the ways that I can draw butane the one that I will actually call butane is just in a straight line. So this one is called butane. But butane has an isomer, and the isomer of butane, I'm just going to draw a little dividing line here, has a branch. So if I take these carbons, and instead of drawing them end to end to end, I make a branch off of the middle carbon, this is the same molecular formula, C4H10, but it has a different structure. So it has a different name and it has slightly different, it's going to have different properties because it has a different structure. And this one actually is called methyl propane because we have a one carbon group branching off of a three carbon chain. So this is no longer called butane to signal that it has different properties, it has a different name. Uh, when we talk about these branched alkanes with these alkyl groups, remember that an alkyl group has the same prefix, but now we'll end in YL, and that's going to be when we take off a hydrogen so that we can kind of stick it onto a chain. So I'm going to first draw a hexane, then I'm going to draw it into two methyl hexane, then I'm going to turn it into 2,2-dimethylhexane. So with any of our hydrocarbons, the last name will tell us the name, will tell us the main chain. So hexane will have six carbons. Ane tells us single bonds. Um, that also signals that we're going to double the number of carbons and add to get the whole total formula. Hexane has three hydrogens here two hydrogens on each of the middle carbons, and then three hydrogens on this end carbon as well. If I want to call this two, or want to make this into two methylhexane, now I'm going to add a carbon to hexane. So this will now be C7H16. This is an isomer of heptane, and I need to add a methyl group, a methyl group on the second carbon. So first carbon, second carbon, methyl group is a carbon that brings its H's with it. And if I want to make this 2,2-dimethylhexane, the di means two separate, hexa, uh, two separate methyl groups, and the two numbers mean that they are both on the same carbon. So now this is meth plus meth plus hex. This is an isomer of C8, uh, C8H18, and the second or the, the second branch goes now on the other side of the second carbon. This is also a methyl group because it's one carbon bringing its H's along. 
When we talk about alkenes and alkynes, they follow the same general rules as the alkanes, except for the fact that now we have a double bond, one double bond for every alkene, and the name ends in ene. We have a triple bond, just one triple bond for every alkyne, and the name ends in ine. Alkenes will follow the general formula CnH2n. Alkynes will follow the general formula CnH2n minus 2, and we still use all of the same prefixes from table P. These are now going to be unsaturated hydrocarbons because they have at least one double or one triple bond. Alkenes have one double bond. I call that double-double. Again, when you have a double bond, you double the carbons to get the hydrogens. Alkynes have one triple bond and follow the general formula CnH2n minus 2. If we want to draw alkenes, propene, prop still means three carbons, but now ene means put a double bond somewhere, means that we're going to double the number of carbons to get the hydrogens. So propene, I'm going to make one of these bonds double, one of them single. Because this carbon has a double bond, it gets less hydrogens. It only gets two more bonds. This carbon only gets one hydrogen and this end carbon gets three. So one, two, three, four, five, six, six hydrogens, one, two, three, three carbons. Every hydrogen has only one thing bonded to it. Every carbon has a total of four bonds. Once again, once we get to butte, we're going to have our isomers. So these guys here are isomers of each other, which means they're both going to be C4H8 but they're going to be connected in a different way. The number tells us which carbon to put the double bond after. So for one butene, I put the double bond after the first carbon. For two butene, I put the double bond after the second carbon. Then I go in and count for each carbon how many more bonds they need, and that tells me how many hydrogens to put in. So this carbon right here has one, two. It gets two hydrogens to get up to four. This carbon only gets one, this carbon gets two hydrogens, and this carbon gets three. In 2-butene, though, the end carbons only each have one bond, so the end carbons each get three hydrogens, and the middle carbons each get one. When we count it out, it comes out to four C's and eight H's, but the double bond has switched places, which is why they are considered isomers. For L, we do something similar. Propine, again, is three C's, but with a triple bond somewhere. So propine, I draw my three C's, and I draw in a triple bond. This is going to be C3H4. Double the carbons and subtract two to get your hydrogens. This carbon only needs one more bond. It gets one hydrogen. This carbon already has four bonds. It gets no hydrogens. And this carbon gets three hydrogens. C3, one, two, three, four for the hydrogens. And if you wanted to draw in your hydrogens, you could. They would go at the end of any bond that has nothing else connected to it. Once we get to butte, again, we have isomers. These are each going to be C4. They are each going to have six H's because when we double four and subtract two, we get six. For one butyne, the triple bond is after the first carbon. For two butyne, the triple bond is after the second carbon. Then we will carefully go in and get each carbon to have a total of four bonds by adding hydrogens. This carbon here gets no hydrogens. And then over here, these carbons only have single bonds, so they get, car they get hydrogens um, above and below here, and then three more. This carbon here gets three hydrogens. Both of these each get no hydrogens and this carbon over here gets three hydrogens. So they're isomers of each other because we've changed the position of the triple bond. When we name hydrocarbons, what I like to do first is find the longest straight chain, which could be not all in a straight line, but this I would call one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, I didn't mean to put this one on here. You know what? We're not going to name this one over here. This one should not have been here. Uh, it doesn't show the bonds. And for the regions exam, we will only have to name hydrocarbons that show the double, single, or triple bonds. So let's start with this one. So I go to my longest chain. I don't see any branches. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons means oct. Double bond somewhere means ene. Then I count from both directions to see which one gives me the lower number. One, two, it could be either three octene or one, two, three, four octene. I'm going to take the smaller number for the position of the double bond. For this one right here, I see that my straight chain has four carbons, but I also have a branch that I have to name. So one, two, three, four in my longest chain is going to be prop. Single bonds gives me ane. This is a methyl group because it has one carbon. So this is going to be, I'm sorry, I counted wrong. I said four was prop. This is going to be methyl butane. Sorry about that. Just making sure that you're paying attention. Oh, actually, I made a mistake. But methyl butane, one, two, three, four carbons is always bute. So this is going to be a methyl group, which means we're going to have to call it something methyl butane. And when I count, I see that this is on the second carbon from one end, but the third carbon from the other. I take the smaller number and I call it 2-methylbutane. For this last one right here, I see that my longest straight chain is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5 is going to give me the prefix pent. My last name is pent. This is a triple bond. Ein. The triple bond is after either the second carbon or the 1, 2, 3rd carbon. So I'm going to call it 2-pentine. And once this is one, two, three, four, this is a methyl group on the fourth carbon. So this is four methyl to pentine. Now, most likely you will not have to do anything like the, that last one there. Um, I just showed it as an example. For our table R, this is our for our organic functional groups. We're going to use this as a map to solve the puzzles for carp, uh, carbon compounds that are not hydrocarbons. And for example, if you have a fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine, you're going to call it a halide. If you have an OH as the only thing besides carbons and hydrogens, you're going to call it an alcohol. If an oxygen joins two chains of carbons, you're going to call it an ether. If you have a double bonded oxygen on an end carbon, you're going to call it an aldehyde. If you have a double bonded oxygen on a carbon that's between two other carbons, you'll call it a ketone. If a molecule ends in COOH, organic acid. If the center of the chain has COOC, you'll call it an ester. Nitrogen makes clean. Nitrogen and oxygen makes it an amide. Now, I don't tend to spend a lot of time on functional groups. Um, you will always have table R, and you will just match up to table R with what's on the compound besides carbons and hydrogens. For organic reactions, we have a few. The first one is substitution, which is just like substituting in a sporting event, where we have the maximum number of atoms already on the molecule. So in order to put something else in, another atom has to come out. I like to use this for single bonds, the molecule is saturated. That means that it will have to undergo substitution in order to change what's in the molecule. And for substitution, you always have two products. So this S links all of this together. So the hydrogen and the chlorine switch places. So now, since they switched places, the hydrogen is now part of where the chlorine was before, and the chlorine is part of where the hydrogen was before. For substitution, we switch one atom at a time. Usually it's going to be halides or um, halogen atoms. Usually because they're diatomic, you're going to see it like this. One of them will go in, and a hydrogen will join the one that, that stays. Addition, though, starts with a double bond. So anything that starts with a double bond will undergo addition, and you will only have a product because we add them together. What happens in addition is that we break the double bond and we make a single bond in its place, which opens up a spot 
for two carbons to each pick something up. So you'll only ever have one product in addition and two separate carbons, the ones that originally had the double bond, will each pick up a new atom. Again, usually you see halogens added. Sometimes you also see hydrogens added to make the alkene into an alkane. For fermentation, you might recognize this one from living environment biology. Yeast uses an enzyme. Sometimes they give you the name of the enzyme called zymase in order to break down sugar and its byproducts are ethanol and carbon dioxide. We call this sometimes, we call this alcoholic fermentation because we make an alcohol. And don't forget also that we make carbon dioxide, which is why alcoholic, um, when we make alcohol, it is, it is carbonated. It has bubbles in it unless we get those bubbles out. For saponification, if we take these first four letters, we can rearrange it into soap. And for saponification, it's a fat plus a strong base, and it makes soap and glycerol. This is just one that we just have to be able to recognize that any metal that ends in OH is a base. If we combine it with a fat, we're going to make soap and glycerol, which is an alcohol. For combustion, I want you to remember burning or fire. We need oxygen to burn something. And when we burn our fuels, which are usually hydrocarbons, or our compounds that have hydrogens, carbons, and oxygens, the compounds that we make will always be CO2 and H2O. If I wanted to balance this one, I'd balance the C's first, then I'd balance the H's, and I'd balance the O's that resulted from that. When we have esterification, I want you to see the word ester. We make esters and we take organic acids and combine them with alcohols to make esters. The H from the acid and the O here from the acid, I'm sorry, the H from the acid and the OH from the alcohol come together to make our water. And then we have this COO connecting onto this C and that would be this part of the chain right here. So they, these guys pop out, right? And then when they pop out, that makes a way for the other ones to kind of slide together and connect. So you will always have, if this was eth and prop, this side will have to have two and three. You can't lose carbons and oxygens along the way. So if we count up, this was two Cs. Here's those two Cs, one, two, three. One, two, three, and if I count up all my H's and O's, they're also accounted for on each side. The acid becomes the ending. Ethanoic acid becomes ethanoate. Propanol becomes propyl. The alcohol always becomes the beginning. Polymerization is joining many so, uh, same units into a larger macromolecule. So we take mono, mers, to join into a polymer and what we will usually actually see in our examples of polymerization is that this N on this side will be in the front. So they'll say many of these join together and now when the N is a subscript we have them connected and they'll usually say large number somewhere around 2,000 or 1,000 or 3,000. They'll just tell you that N is very big. So we in class played with Orbeez, which are the same polymer that's found in diapers that can absorb a lot of water. And remember we said that these monomers join together to make polymers. A monomer is a single unit. The polymer is when those units are all joined together. We have different kinds of polymerization. Addition polymerization breaks a double bond. Condensation polymerization removes water. But you would most likely see something like this where the N is in the front in the reactants and the N is at the back at the subscript in the products to show that they are now connected. So I believe this is the end of our review video on organic chemistry. I know it was a little bit of a longer video, but it covers the entire chapter and what we did in class. Hopefully this was very helpful for you. And for those of you who are my students, please make sure that if you have any more questions or need any help, that you come and see me in extra help, uh, in extra help after school. And um, if you're not one of my students, you can certainly uh, go to my YouTube channel, Mrs. T Chem Talk um, on YouTube, and try to find some more help there. 
So happy studying.